Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Today, let's go to British Columbia and interview an old friend, Thomas Homer Dixon. Um, this is a conversation we should have had about 30 years ago, but we didn't know what we we're going to talk about then, and uh, we didn't know much of the stuff that we will talk about uh, at the time, because uh, life has presented us new challenges in the meantime. About 1983, I was active in Science for Peace, and we had meetings in Anatole Rappaport's home and started talking about organizing a peace studies program at the University of Toronto. Well, uh, they did, they did, I did, but uh, mostly uh, Science for Peace organized this and got it going. And then I started doing the same thing at my campus, which is in Mississauga. It's called Arendelle College at the time. And uh, the first person who became the real uh, leading star of the uh, Peace Studies program on the main campus, the University of Toronto, was uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, familiarly known to everybody as TAD. Now, so far as I know, this is the first time we ever sat down with a cup of coffee and talked to each other about our respective programs. Yet he led one on the main campus and I led one in Mississauga. And they were quite different programs. Um, looking back on it, um, we each had one, we're touching one part of the elephant, I think. I was very interested in uh, such issues as teaching the importance of uh, abolition of nuclear weapons and other weapons of <laughs> warfare in general, but uh, building institutions that, uh, you know, international law and so on that would make that possible. And uh, also a focus on uh, nonviolence. And um, Tad was much more interested in, I think, the relationship between uh, material resources and conflicts, because he had a major project on how shortage of uh, scarce resources uh, led people into battles and warfare. And uh, we never once had a single conversation with each other until now. So how about it, Tad? <laughs> Shall we talk? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm delighted. <laughs> Wonderful uh, summary of some of our history. That's terrific. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, you've gone on to higher things. You've uh, I've retired 25 years ago or so, but you went to uh, Waterloo and were active in running a program there. And then you moved out to your roots to British Columbia and are now heading a think tank called the Cascade Institute. And I think you 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 had your finger on some of the right things. You know, in the days when we were talking about the impact of material circumstances on conflict, the one thing we never talked about was climate. And, and you know, I think that topic came kind of crept up on us. I can't put a date on when we started talking about it. It just kind of snuck in. <laughs> what do you think? So that's been a long-standing interest of mine, Meta. And now, as you say, going back, I suppose, uh, more than 30 years. Uh, and I brought that interest with me when I came from my doctoral work in the United States in the late 1980s and came to the University of Toronto to, to uh, work on building the Peace and Conflict Studies program at the University of Toronto. And, uh, and, and I had already started thinking about the relationship between material factors, such as water scarcity, or uh, in poor countries, shortages of fuel wood, declining quality of agricultural land, and social instability and violence, especially in poor countries. But climate change was very much on my radar screen then. So when I was finishing up my doctorate in the late 1980s, uh, 88, 89, at MIT, I was one of the co-founders of a small group of young scholars at MIT and Harvard and Boston University called the International Environmental Issues Study Group. And uh, if you recall, 1988 was the, the summer that James Hansen as a young climate scientist from NASA, NASA Goddard, was called in front of Congress to testify in front of Senate in the United States by Senator Al Gore. And he said, he said, the climate signal is emerging from the noise. We're now starting to see a, a clear indication of the, the impacts of climate change in the, in the climate record. And, uh, 
And I remember that summer, 1988, was a brutally hot summer across the United States. And uh, Time Magazine had a uh, an image on its cover of a of a a globe that was sort of a globe balloon that was all sort of wrapped up with rope and was obviously struggling, you know. And there was a, a sense it was really when the climate issue really broke through into the public consciousness a bit. So it was at that time that I started to look at the relationship between climate change and violent conflict. And, and even though it was a long way into the future, I mean, we knew that the real impacts of climate change wouldn't occur for decades. I felt that it was important to start thinking about it at that point, especially its relationships to things like water availability and agricultural productation, productivity, economic productivity. And, uh, and so if you look back at the original causal maps I did in the late 1980s and early 1990s, some of which were published in the journal International Security in 1991, uh, climate change or what we called in those days global warming was, uh, was right there in, in those causal maps. Um, but more in, in sort of an anticipatory way because we understood that the impacts wouldn't appear, wouldn't become very severe. My timeline for these things has always been 30 to 50 years. I, I, I really, my work on the relationship between environmental stress and violent conflict was always projecting in the early 1990s out to the 2020s, 2030s or so, and even beyond. And I've always anticipated that things would actually get very bad about now if we didn't appropriately respond to the problem. And sure enough, that's where we are. It's getting really bad. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, and then now, now, of course, there's an enormous amount of research on environment, on, on, on climate and conflict all over the world. Research institutes, governmental institutes, NATO is setting up a center for excellence. There's all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but the, the underlying understanding of the causal mechanisms hasn't changed very much since the, since the 1990s when we did our original work. Okay, but you know, I think it, 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 if I look back on that period in when I was teaching at all about the physical uh, necessities of life and how they bear on our uh, on peace issues, uh, it, it mostly had to do with um, issues about scarcity and and uh, running out of natural resources. Yes, and and not so much on on temperature. Uh, I don't think I ever taught a, a single lecture about global warming, uh, that, to my shame, <laughs> <But> <laughs> because I'm trying to make up for it now. <laughs> but uh, at the time, and you know, to be honest, I think this is still a lingering thing. Uh, just this week, I've been I've run into two conflicts with uh, colleagues, uh, peace activists, and so on. Uh, uh, disputes, let's call it something nicer than conflicts, but uh, arguments. And uh, I think uh, there is still a very important prevailing uh, ethos among activists uh, and environmental, many environmentalists that really all you need to do is leave nature alone and everything will straighten itself out. And, and uh, you know, consume less uh, let's live simply and um, don't use technology because technology is just going to look at what it's the predicament it's got us in so far. And it's only going to get us in worse trouble if we keep using it. So I've had arguments with people about such things as whether or not there are any possible technological innovations that are useful for removing carbon from the atmosphere. And I find that, you know, I get fireworks every time I go there. Uh, I still think that is a residue of uh, a, a, a position that was prevalent in the 70s and 80s that, um, you know, technology has got us in trouble and and can't help us much. What do you think? Well, a lot of issues there. Um... Just as an aside on one of your initial comments, that in some ways climate change is inducing scarcity. So you're right that many of the original conversations were about the effects of scarcity on conflict, mm-hmm. scarcity of water, or what, what, fights over water, for example, fresh water. Um, but it, it, you know, climate 
change for, among other things, does induce scarcity of those resources such as water because it makes water uh, less available in some parts of the world. Uh, but also you can, think of, you can think of the changing climate as kind of a scarcity of, a, of a, uh, an important set of natural mechanisms that maintain the equilibrium of our, for instance, agricultural systems. And as, as those mechanisms of carbon absorption and hydrological cycles and start, start to uh, exhibit a lot more variance in their behavior, that's a scarcity of, of uh, the relatively benign equilibrium climate that has allowed human civilization to develop in the past. So I still think of climate problems as essentially problems of scarcity. Uh, scarcity of services, I guess you could say, vital natural services. Mm -hmm. So to get to your, your question, um, uh, the idea that we can just leave nature alone and it will, everything will be fine is pretty an anachronistic now, frankly. Uh, there's no undisturbed nature anywhere on this planet at this point. We have, we have uh, fundamentally altered natural systems from microbes all the way up to global flows of carbon and nitrogen and sulfur and the like. So whether we like it or not, we've created a garden on this planet in the sense that we are manipulating the nature around us. And uh, we're making a mess of it for the most part because we're damaging those services that, upon which we so vitally depend, such as hydrological cycles, pollinators and the like, fish stocks. Uh, grievously damaging them in a lot of cases. So we are, we can't just sort of step away at this point and say, and in a sense, reduce our footprint. First of all, there are just too many people on this planet uh, approaching uh, 8 billion people. Um, and, and secondly, we just got, uh, are we over 8 billion now? I don't think we are. I think we're just okay. about to get 8 billion. Any day now. Yeah, any, any day. Away. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, oh my God, are we at 8 billion yet? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we're still adding, I think, 70 to 80 million people a year. And 50% uh, of that population is still in profoundly poor and desperately in need of the services that you and I take for granted on a daily basis, including reasonably good medical care, availability of food, economic security. Uh, and so there's a profound need for, and I hate to say it, economic growth. Economic growth that makes people's lives better. Mm -hmm. uh, and since that economic growth is also in many respects what's killing us on this planet or wrecking our natural and environmental systems, then there's a pr profound need for the re redistribution of wealth within our global systems from those of us who are doing very well to those of us who need to do better. Um, and that's a, a, pr a profoundly intractable problem, which we haven't effectively grappled okay, with. But now you talk about population growth as a major, and a lot of people, more people than you do. Uh, but in fact, the, the countries that are the most advanced so to speak, technologically have no growth, uh, no natural growth in population. And the growth is taking place in, in countries that are not producing the climate yes. problems. Yeah. And so the, where, the, where the population is, isn't where the troubles are emerging. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't just look at population growth in the aggregate and population size in the aggregate because you also have to look at consumption patterns, the technologies people use. Mm -hmm. uh, so one person in Canada is on average consuming 40 times the resources of a, a person in India. So uh, nonetheless, on the aggregate, uh, the global population is, is far too large for the aggregate consumption that the human species is engaged in, in terms of consumption of basic resources and output of waste such as carbon dioxide. Um, there needs to be, in, in terms of that balance between poor and rich on this planet, uh, there needs to be a, a, a reduction of the inequalities, profound reduction of the inequalities, which we seem to be incapable of doing as a species. If anything, well, the wealth no, gaps I, are widening. Not to, not to be obnoxious, but 
if if we if I give all of my stuff away to poor people, they are going to start emitting as much carbon as I am. So, right. so this gets to your point. This gets to your point about technological interventions. And so one of the things we're doing at the Cascade Institute is focusing very much on what kinds of technologies would allow us to raise the wealth of everybody on the planet without wrecking the planet's ecosystems and environment at the same time. Uh, and, and the fundamental issue there, Meta, as everybody knows, is energy supply. It's It really comes down to energy. The, the What's driving climate change and what's driving so much of the environmental damage around the world is the is the uh, the production of and the and the consumption and burning of fossil fuels, and uh, and so we need we need zero carbon alternatives, uh, and and also because we are way beyond the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that produce that equitable climate that I was talking about before. Uh, we need to start thinking about getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So I am com in complete agreement with you. Now, there, there are a variety of ways of doing that. We could build big factories that suck carbon out of the atmosphere. We could plant lots of plants that are good at sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, but I, this is going to be, if humankind is going to survive on this planet, and I think this is an existential threat to us, we're going to in, be engaged in a centuries long project of reducing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and at the same time, we have to, we have to find out, we have to develop technologies that, that prevent us from adding yet more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So we have to get off fossil fuels as fast as possible. These are fundamentally technological problems. The idea that we can't address or that we can address the challenges we face by rejecting technology and living simple lives is, I think it's just profoundly naive, honestly. And I think you and I are probably on the same page there. It's too late for that. There might've been a time when there were 2 billion people on the planet where we could have all spread out across the surface of the planet and lived simple agricultural lives, you know, in local communities, sort of the transition town stuff. It's too late now. There are too many of us with too many deep, deep demands that need to be satisfied on a very small planet that has to be very carefully managed at this point if we're going to survive. And, and frankly, if one part, substantial part of the human population fails and collapses, it will probably take the rest of the human population with it. We're, we're in a profound situation of shared fate at this point. Yeah. It, it, you know, we can't, I, I get from people all the time, so where can I go, they ask me, where can I go? to be safe from climate change? Where can I go when things start to fall apart to be safe? And I say, nowhere, mm -hmm. because these energy fluxes as caused by the increased carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere are affecting the entire planet. Mm -hmm. New Zealand is going to burn too, you know? And, uh, and, and we are profoundly dependent upon each other on this planet, whether we admit it or not, uh, for, for our well-being. So let's pull together and figure it out as a group. That's the only only possible route forward. You use the word economic growth and you apologize for even editing the word. <laughs> Those are uh, that is a, a conversation that I, I need to develop much more extensively. I had one conversation with a Robert Holland, I think is his name, who had a book with uh, Noam Chomsky uh, about this subject. But this is I think this is where we have to figure out what what we can do that looks like economic growth because i'm i'm scared that if we had if we stopped economic growth we'd have a a, a huge not a recession a, a complete economic collapse and we would have a revolution too right yes. mm -hmm. from all those folks who are saying well you're living very well thank you very much what about us who are living on five dollars a day or less which is about 40 percent of the world's population right now so how can we have economic growth and get off fossil fuels and remove carbon from the atmosphere and maybe even uh, radiation management, solar yes. radiation management? Those are all things that I am open to, not yeah. only open to, but I think we need to actively begin investigating them in a big way. And I've got four of these that I'm uh, working with Pugwash to, to produce talk shows about a series of talk shows to try to really look in depth at these uh, possible ways of of reducing climate, uh, reducing carbon, or uh, shading the planet. 
Yes. Okay. So you're in enormously controversial territory, as you know. <laughs> That's why I have so all these fights with my friends. Yeah, but I, I'm basically on the same page. I, I don't think we should be leaving any options off, off the table. And that includes, by the way, nuclear power. I'm not a big fan of nuclear power. I think we, there are better options. But we can't do everything we need to do with photovoltaic solar power or wind turbines for a very fundamental reason that 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 I think a lot of folks on the environmental left neglect, which is that not to, not to break, not to interrupt you, but let me interrupt you. And okay. that is, you had a wonderful article in the Globe about six or eight months, maybe a year ago, about geoengineering. And yeah, ge ge geothermal, geo ultra deep geothermal yes, power. Yes. 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 Uh, get back with it. Don't don't forget that. We want to talk. No, no, no. In fact, I was just about to get there. Okay. <laughs> so the fundamental challenge. So it, 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 I, I wrote a book back in 2006 called The Upside of Down, mm -hmm. uh, Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilization. And the basic thesis of that book, or the basic sort of arc of the book, was a focus on energy and civilization, and especially energy quality and civilization. Mm -hmm. So the only way we maintain the complexity of our societies is through enormous inputs of energy. There's a fundamental relationship between complexity and energy consumption. In thermodynamic terms, our societies are far from thermodynamic equilibrium. We maintain them that it's like it's like a ball in a basin in a bowl and, we're, and, and the society is that ball and you're pushing it up the side of the basin and holding it there. You're working to hold it there. And if the energy inputs stop, then it rolls back down. That's the collapse process, the, the, the decline of complexity, what we saw, for instance, in Rome when the Roman Empire collapsed. In fact, in the book, I spent a lot of time on Rome. Uh, so we can't, and this is where, again, I, depart, I part company, I'd expect you part company with some of your environmental colleagues and friends, is that we can't actually maintain anything resembling a complex human civilization which provides an enormous number of benefits to each of us individually without huge inputs of energy. And that energy has to be of a particular kind. It needs to be high quality, thermodynamically high quality, which means it needs to be relatively ordered. Electricity is a high quality form of energy, for example. And, uh, and, and it, needs to be, it needs to have other characteristics, one of which uh, is very important and gets neglected is power density, which is basically when you're producing it, when you're producing this, this energy, how many watts do you get per square meter of the surface of the earth that you are occupying with your production facilities? So a nuclear power plant will have a, a power density of hundreds of watts, maybe seven, 800 watts per square meter. An oil well will have a power density of thousands of watts per square meter. The consumption in downtown Toronto and those skyscrapers downtown, to downtown Toronto of power is around 5,000 watts per square meter. If you try to power our modern industrial civilization using PV solar and wind, which has power densities of around five watts per square meter, mm. you have to cover enormous territories of the landscape, enormous spans of the landscape with your wind turbines and your solar panels in order to create enough power to actually support this highly dense urban conglomeration and highly complex urban conglomeration with its skyscrapers and everything. Now, maybe over time, you could dismantle all of that and move it across the, the countryside and simplify the world, but that's not the way the world is right now. Uh, you know, we have enormous concentrations of people and big industrial facilities like aluminum smelters, and steel plants, and chip manufacturing facilities which we all, I mean, we're using the products of it right now in our conversation in this, with these machines in front of us. So if we're not going to give that up, we need energy and we need a lot of it and it needs to have high power density. So this gets me to ultra deep geothermal. Um, we, we, can't, we can't get to where we need to go, including dealing with the growth problem, if we are going to rely on wind and solar power. Just, it's impossible. The figures don't add up, things don't tally. So people are talking about nuclear power. They're talking about gas with carbon capture and storage underground, you know, natural gas. And then you take the carbon dioxide and pump it underground. But we believe at the Cascade Institute that one of the best alternatives that's not been investigated is what we call ultra deep geothermal. So in this case, 
you would go 10 to 15 kilometers underground into hot, dry rock. You pump fluid down there, just water, and you pump it into an input well and pump it out an output well, and you crack the rock in between. And you heat this water up to at least 150 degrees Celsius, ideally closer to 300 degrees. You bring it back up to the surface and you use it to drive steam turbines to generate electricity. Now that can get you, we believe, power densities potentially in the hundreds of watts per square meter, maybe even the thousands of watts per square meter. So something comparable to a nuclear power plant. If we could develop the drilling technology, you could actually drop these wells in the middle of the city like Toronto or Kitchener-Waterloo or Ottawa. And you take a, 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 a square block in the middle of the city, you have your power plant and you provide the power to the immediate urban area. Um, the, the issue here is being able to drill fast and cheaply and deeply through really hard rock. Because the drilling that we do for our conventional oil wells right now is through sedimentary rock. The drilling that we need to be able to do for ultra deep thermal, ultra deep geothermal would be through igneous or metamorphic rock, which is a hundred or maybe even a thousand times harder. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different engineering challenge. There are four technological pathways that seem to be opening up to break through that engineering challenge. And we, we are at the Cascading Institute starting to investigate each of those four pathways and try to figure out how Canada can be situated as a leader in this area. Uh, so, you know, this, the elevator pitch for ultra deep geothermal is this. Why build a whole bunch of little nuclear power plants across the surface of the planet with all of their attendant waste disposal and proliferation risks when we can actually tap the heat of the biggest nuclear reactor on the planet that's the best shielded nuclear reactor on the planet, which happens to be the core of the planet, which is, and that heat is just relatively short distance of 10 to 15 kilometers under our feet. Right. That makes an a virtually unlimited amount of power that could be that could power all societies on the planet as long as you could drill. So, uh, so for us, this is That's an entirely beautiful. persuasive possibility, right? Absolutely. I want to I want to be in touch with you as you investigate this because I don't I I don't think I'm capable of asking the right questions. I was about to to try to uh, pin down oh. these folks, but. Um, uh, I, I should say one thing that's exciting. One thing that's exciting is that people are really enthusiastic about this research program, and we've just received a substantial grant to go to the next stage of our research. So people recognize this is something that needs to be done. That we need to, you know, as I said before, we need to we need to fire all our guns, or we need to shoot all the arrows in our quiver. And this is one that has not been that has not been effectively deployed yet. And it needs to be as quickly as possible. Well, the question is how soon it can be deployed. Well, I, mean, I got the impression it's, you know, maybe 10 years away. Well, here, here's the thing. Inevitably, this is, this is a, there's some very serious engineering challenges here. But, you know, we can either say, oh, it's going to take too long. Therefore, let's not do it. Or we get going on it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, Elon Musk, whether you like him or not. Uh, recognized that he could revolutionize the space launch industry if he could land his boosters and reuse his boosters. And, and there was very serious R&D valley of death there. Nobody was prepared to make the investments to try to solve the basic technological problems, but he did. And we know it was messy. There were boosters blew up on the pads and stuff like that. But he's done it and he's cut launch costs by 90% and he now has 70% of the launch market in the world. Okay. So, so we, we believe that this is an equivalent technological challenge and it's certainly easier than fusion, which we're investing hundreds of millions, not billions of dollars in. And it's certainly, and I that, believe- it, Which keeps being 50 years away. Always 50 <laughs> years away, right. And, and, and I, I believe, and I, I should say, I come to this with a little bit of experience because I put myself through university working in the oil patch in Alberta in, in the 1970s and 80s. And uh, I, I think this is a, a, an engineering challenge that is nowhere near as difficult as uh, many engineering challenges human beings have solved in the history of the species. So let's get on with it. 
I would I would suspect that with sufficient investment, we could start to have plants coming online in 20 years, 15 to 20 years, and making a major difference in terms of the energy production. And certainly by the end of the century, the the our energy system could be substantially powered by deep geothermal. Okay, I'm 91. I'm not going to be here in 20 years. Uh, so I want something that can be done within five. So that my um, criterion for picking uh, winners is to find things that Canadians can do without asking permission from other countries and get it going within five years. Um, so, and that's perfectly reasonable. So, so you know, what we're going to do now is ramp up wind and solar and hydro and all the, the low carbon energy systems. But that's not gonna get India off. We're actually perceiving this as a global play in a sense that Canada can be the leader in, a, in, a, in this new global industry. And there's no plausible way of getting India off coal right now mm -hmm. uh, with PV, solar and wind. So we can, we can uh, produce most of the zero carbon electricity we need with the technologies that are on the table in Canada. Um, there will be gaps appearing decades going out. But in terms of your five year timeline, there's lots of stuff where we can do. We can do. And probably what's going to happen, I would suspect that we'll have these big wind turbine farms and solar arrays and stuff. And then 2040 or so, we'll be rolling them up because we've got a better technology. Mm -hmm. And then okay. we'll be returning that landscape to farms or to nature, which is what ultimately we want to do. But but in the meantime, we're going to, you, know, you say India is going to keep using coal, China will too, they're all going to emit is. So we have to do some carbon reduction. And carbon you know, reduction. And, pick, and the other thing. Other, let's let's handicap yeah. our, our choices. My number one pick is uh, carbon negative concrete. What's yours? Yes. In terms of immediate interventions, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, uh, in, in, that will make a big difference. Um, methane. We've got to get on top of methane emissions. Okay. How about iron yes. salt? Iron salt, methane um, spraying. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing about methane is is um, because of industries like fracking and uh, liquid natural gas and stuff that we're using more and more natural gas and its fundamental constituent is methane. And so we're getting a lot of fugitive emissions. Uh, there are enormous, as we're beginning to realize there are an enormous number of wells in the world that are, that are abandoned, oil and gas wells that are leaking, uh, maybe small amounts each individual well, but cumulatively enormous amounts. Um, the, the climate scientists I know say that we can get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of slowing global warming by working on methane really fast mm -hmm. because it has a it has a car, a car it has a warming potential of 20 to 30 times that of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. uh, molecule per molecule it also decays from the atmosphere fairly quickly too but but it has a huge impact in the short term so uh, now I, I agree you know uh, carbon neutral concrete, Big problem: cows and their and their uh, belching, you know, methane, changing the feed for cows, or even going to test tube meat, which I think is going to be in our future. Um, uh, um, carbon sequestration in agricultural lands, huge opportunities there. Um, rock dust. That I'm le I'm leaning to rock dust, biochar, and seaweed uh, biostimulants. Yeah. Yeah, that you have, but the problem is scale, right? So biochar and rock dust and things. I mean, getting getting the kinds of billions of tons of carbon out of the atmosphere that we need. The the only practice in the world that's in essentially worldwide that has the potential to absorb huge amounts of carbon is agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. And and so changing agricultural practices to capture carbon could make a huge difference. But you mentioned something else a while ago that I think you know, probably drives your colleagues and friends up the wall, but we have to put on the table, which is also solar radiation management. There will be a period of time during which we're adjusting the, the, the energy structure and, and economic structure of global civilization, mm -hmm. the fundamental energy technologies, during which we overshoot the, the temperature thresholds at which things can go really haywire, in particular at which the global climate 
ocean atmospheric circulatory systems, circulation systems and the like can reconfigure themselves, shut down of the North Atlantic uh, circulation, the meridional overturning circulation or what they used to call the thermal haline circulation or the Gulf Stream, uh, melting, a rapid melting of Greenland, collapse of the West Antarctic, Antarctica ice sheet, uh, um, cessation of the monsoons in India and South Asia, um, all kinds of things could happen as the system reconfigures itself with this extra energy that that we're pumping into it. So, so I, I the thing they to, to the prevent that from that happening scares me the worst is the possibility of a big methane explosion from the Slapdev Sea in one of the sh shallow uh, parts of the Arctic Ocean. Yeah, or or an issue that we're looking at in the Cascade Institute, which is permafrost thawing and the massive releases of methane and carbon dioxide from the permafrost. So we have a big I wanted project to br on. bring you to the permafrost yeah, idea yeah. because I think that is so important. So. Go so, on. you know, to prevent to prevent this kind of overshoot where we start to see these flips in the system, the dying off of the Amazon, for example, and, and which which fundamentally would be irreversible. Once the Amazon dies, you're not going to you're not going to bring back that rainforest. Once the once the uh, Greenland ice sheet melts substantially or has uh, started the process of rapid degradation, you're not going to reverse that process. So these are these are systems that exhibit what complexity scientists call hysteresis, which basically means they're irreversible in in the short to intermediate term. So to prevent that, we probably need to reduce the solar flux for a period of time, maybe several decades, maybe fifty years, while we go through this recon reconfiguration of the of the global economy and our and change our energy system. And frankly, while also the global population peaks and starts to decline, which is going to happen this century. The peak around 10 billion and then start to decline. So so I see this as I see solar radiation management as a interim measure, which is not permanent, but would, would allow us to make the transition to a different set of technologies and different economic structures on the planet. Okay, when I talk about they're this, they're not all alike, you know. I mean, I when spraying sulfur is one thing, and brightening the clouds is quite a different thing, from my point right. of view. I right, or, or or solar panels, you know, reflective mirrors in space. There's, you know, and I, I my concern, Meta, and I think you share it. It's interesting that we're on this conversation. Is that there is a there is such Um, there's such dissension generated by the by even the e e even the speculation about these technologies or even an initial conversation that we're not doing the basic research we need to do to find out whether anything would work or not. Mm -hmm. It's like we're not even able to do the research. Exactly. Which strikes me. And, and it's not just research on the technologies, but research on the governance mechanisms. So who gets to make these decisions? Mm -hmm. What kind of global arrangement are we going to have to make sure that it's as fair as possible? It's like, it's, if people are so resistant to even going there that we're not doing the basic work we need to do to figure out if eventually we have to go there, what the best pathway is. Well, you know, they have this G word that I'm not even gonna utter. because Geoengineering, <laughs> I'll utter it. <laughs> throws people into a total panic and they run for the exits. But well, you know, they think they think the problem is moral hazard, that as soon as you start talking about that, it just lets all the carbon emitters off the hook. And I can I get that, right? I, I understand that there's a moral hazard issue here because there are a lot of there are a lot of bad actors out there who have been saying all along, well, technology will fix it. We'll find a solution to this problem. In the meantime, let's just admit. And the fossil fuel industries are are among the worst of those folks. And, and so, and, and many, many people in, the, in that industry have been saying, well, eventually we'll just geoengineer and we'll solve that problem that way. So I can understand why people on the environmental left say, well, we're just giving them what they've always wanted and they're letting, we're letting them off the hook. I get that. On the other hand, I don't think we sh that, that that's an argument for not doing at least the research. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, we're there. Uh, I think we're so much in agreement. Tell me more about your 
you're, by the way, I will say that what I'm enthusiastic about are two things. Uh, well, not only the uh, uh, climate negative, uh, uh, carbon negative concrete, but uh, uh, but also um, uh, brightening the clouds over the Arctic. And we have, we're promoting a thing to try to brighten just the ones over Hudson Bay, because Canada owns Hudson Bay, and we can do it without organizing the rest of the world. And it can't refreeze the Hudson Bay completely, but we could keep parts of it frozen in the summertime. So that's that's number one. And the other thing is this project to uh, turn uh, methane into CO2 and water by bumping it into iron salt um, yes. uh, 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 filings or you know particles of iron salt in the air, which I think has great promise. So, uh, you know, I'm enthusiastic about those. But the place that stumped me is where you refer to permafrost, because I can't, I know how, if we had people busy doing it, I, I could see how to keep the Arctic cold enough uh, pretty soon, within five years. But I don't know what to do about keeping the permafrost cold, because the Arctic Ocean is one thing, and you can't do this uh, brightening the clouds over land. And uh, and I don't. I, uh, although I love the Zemoffs, I, I don't really believe that we can bring back herds of uh, woolly mammoths or even bison <laughs> to, to, to keep the, the 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 soil uh, frozen in the Arctic. Uh, what's your angle on that? Well, um, so the Cascade Institute got involved in the permafrost issue somewhat through happenstance, I guess you might say. There was a, a, a very well-known clean tech venture capitalist, uh, Mike Brown on the West Coast of Canada. I've known him for many years. He's been concerned for decades about permafrost carbon feedback. So this is, this is the feedback process, not just the permafrost thawing, but the release of methane and carbon dioxide from the permafrost that can then cause more warming and accelerate the thaw, right? So that's a positive feedback loop. He's been very concerned about that, did some of his own modeling of it uh, just to get this basic dimensions of the problem back in the, uh, in the in 2010 or so, engaged with a number of climate scientists and eventually organized on his own, with his own resources, a program of conversations, which he called a dialogue. So in uh, early 2021, in March 2021, Mike and his team sponsored uh, four weeks of conversations involving up to 400 scientists around the world on permafrost carbon feedback. So oh. every, every week for uh, two hours we met. And that really pulled together uh, a global network or what we call a community of intent of people who are concerned about this issue. Then it was decided to hand this over to the Cascade Institute because there was no actual in institutional structure for, for uh, maintenance of this program. But when I was asked if we would do this, the Cascade Institute, I stipulated one thing. I said, okay, I'm, I think it's very important to establish what the fluxes are and what the trend lines are for carbon and methane emission from thawing permafrost. We think the emissions are already about half a billion tons of carbon annually, so a lot very significant amount of uh, carbon coming out of thawing permafrost around the world. But we don't really know. There are huge error bars around that figure. Uh, so that's important. We need to have a better understanding, in part because it will influence national and global co uh, carbon budgets in a profound way. How, how good is the monitoring technology? Uh, I just had yesterday an argument with somebody about uh, how much the wet wetlands, the lowlands around the the bottom of the uh, Hudson Bay are emitting uh, methane. Apparently, yeah. it's a big hot spot. But yeah, uh, so is this something that technologically can be uh, precise? Uh, well, you can you, you can you can do much better at it. So there are things called sentinel flux towers, which are basically measurement devices that you want to place across the countryside. And so we're working with a group of Americans at the Woodwell Institute on uh, in Woods Hole, Cape Cod, and also at Harvard University, who are implementing a, a global program of flux towers. Originally, they were going to have 20 or so in Siberia, but of course, that's not possible anymore. So there are going to be a, a number in Canada, including in the Hudson's Bay area. So that's something we could 
have a separate conversation about. But here's the thing too, you know, I actually don't think that describing the problem is enough. We need to actually think about, and I stipulated when we took on this effort at the Cascade Institute, I said, yeah, we can do this, but we're interested in interventions. Interventions that could slow potentially permafrost thaw, but also in those areas where you've had the collapse of the landscape because of the thaw, which is a process called thermal karsting. Uh, what can be done to increase carbon intake in those areas to slow carbon releases and increase carbon intake. Now, one of the interesting things about, about this is that, of course, their landscape in the north, permafrost areas are almost universally inhabited by indigenous communities of various kinds. The de population densities are low, but nonetheless, they depend upon the landscapes for their livelihood. So we put in the heart of our work uh, that kind of consultation with indigenous communities. But in those areas that have thawed where you've seen thermal karsting and a collapse of the structure of the landscape because the ice has gone away, that's not available for a conventional indigenous customary resource extraction processes, uh, hunting reindeer, for example, or whatever, mm -hmm. and our caribou. And so it may be that in those areas, we could, there are things we can do to increase carbon intake. So one of, the, one of the scientists we're connected with thinks that you could engineer sphagnum moss to, uh, to grow very rapidly, and create uh, and to absorb a lot of carbon in relatively short periods of time in these regions. Now, this, this is at the boundary of probability, right? When, when I talk to leading scientists about intervention possibilities, they say, oh, how are you gonna do that? And I say, well, the Cascade Institute's in the business of asking exactly those questions. Maybe in the end, we'll throw up our hands and say that there's nothing that can be done in terms of carbon absorption. I mean, the big problem, there are two problems. One is insulation is very low. You don't have a huge amount of energy flux except, except for a very short period of time during the year. And the second is that a lot of these areas are like deserts. There's not a huge amount of water. So it makes using biological processes difficult, but who knows? Uh, we need to look carefully at what the possibilities are. The fact remains that there will be billions of hectares of land that is essentially unusable in these areas that could become enormous reservoirs for absorbing carbon dioxide, carbon from the atmosphere. And by the way, that would bring a lot of wealth to the North because those would be offset credits if uh, those regions could be converted into carbon sinks. So that's the that's the the aspiration of the Cascade Institute in this project is to investigate whether there's any anything that is is plausible on the intervention front. Yeah, well, I would love to believe that Moss would do it, but you're talking about absorbing CO two, but not, but you know, that's to handle the methane problem, which is thirty to a hundred times worse you know i mean right. it turns out plants it, don't absorb methane unfortunately right it, it turns out that when i've um uh in, in in the research i've seen recently the the carbon dioxide emissions from falling from frost are much much more substantial than the methane emissions but most people uh, are under the impression that it's the reverse but the co2 emissions are actually huge uh, relatively CO2 huge. emissions are huge, but but you need 30 CO2 molecules yes. to equal the, the warming power of one methane. Right. So right. Well, the other thing then is you actually need to you need to reduce the rate of thaw. And so in the first in, in the first dialogue, there was a very interesting satellite photograph from space uh, by shown by a scientist in, the, in Mike Brown's first permafrost carbon feedback dialogue in March 20. 2021. And it showed it showed the boundary between Finland and Norway. And I can't remember which side was which, but one side was relatively dark and one side was relatively light. So the albedo was higher on one side and lower on the other. And on the side where the albedo was significantly higher, the thaw, of course, was a lot lower because sunlight was being reflected back into space. And the difference between the two sides of the border was the density of the reindeer populations. Because on the side with the uh, the side with the dark landscape, the reindeer population was much denser and was eating all the lichen that uh, that otherwise would have raised the albedo of the landscape and reflected sunlight back into space. Hold on, you're saying that the the physical quality of the of the reindeer they're dark enough 
to actually change the no 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 it's that they were eating the lichen they were eating the lichen on, on the landscape they basically stripped the landscape of lichen which was a light color and in the process they did they uh lowered the albedo of the landscape so that it absorbed more solar radiation and accelerated permafrost thaw. Okay, okay. Well, that, so that, uh, that's a that, relatively uh, simple intervention then. That actually is a verification of the Zemoff's theory, thesis, you know, that if you had a lot of herds of, of big animals, uh, not only uh, eating, uh, 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 opening up the this, this snow and eating the frozen grass underneath, uh, but also knocking over saplings so they don't become trees that, uh, you know, have to uh, uh, affect the albedo, that uh, that's the best way to keep the... Well, except it's in some, in some ways, and of course, this is where scientific research is so important. In some ways, it's the reverse. In this case, the higher the density of the reindeer population, the, the lower the coverage of the lichen so the lower the albedo and the higher the permafrost thaw. So, so in this case, you oh. actually need, you, you even need to control the reindeer population to reduce its to reduce its density in order for the lichen to survive and reflect the sunlight. Got it. Okay. All right. That's a little wrinkle in the problem. <laughs> it is, isn't it? But the, the the point here is that you can, and and the reason I tell that story is because there are plausible, relatively simple interventions that could make a big difference to the rate of permafrost thaw in the North that don't involve, for instance, solar radiation management, although we may have to go there. There may be other things that we can do in the, in the meantime that are relatively straightforward. I, I'm not uh, free to disclose much about this because it's all totally experimental, but I heard the word titanium, <laughs> that you know the problem is there's uh, dust that settles on the snow and and reduces the albedo. So uh, it, what you need to do is spray something uh, that will have some of the same effects as brightening the clouds or um, or uh, uh, the iron salt um, em emissions knocking out the methane in the air. But do it with something uh, that's white because yes. when it lands on the snow, it's not gonna have that effect. So the, I, I think I'm not, I may even should delete this because I don't know. I think I'm talking about this when I shouldn't be, but that's uh, still such an interesting uh, option that I, I can't let the uh, conversation go past without it. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, we will know in a few weeks whether or not that is a realistic thing to, to try to do. That, but keep in mind the word titanium. Okay, <laughs> certainly well. That's like you know in the in that movie uh, back in the day when the guy gives the secret of of success and he whispers in the ear in the kid's ear plastic. Plastics, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> so you look how that turned out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> titanium, my friend. <laughs> okay, so tell me what else the Cascade folks are doing that the rest of the world should know about. Well, we talked about two of our projects, ultra deep geothermal and the permafrost carbon feedback. Um, we have an additional project, which we call our polycrisis project, which basically asks the question, why are so many things going haywire in the world simultaneously? Why are so many crises going critical simultaneously? Mm -hmm. So people might think it's just a coincidence. We have a war, we have climate change, we have rising authoritarianism, we have collapsing biodiversity. We're arguing that it's likely these pro these processes are connected together in ways that we don't fully understand, and we need to understand those connections better. So we, in fact, I believe we're going to have a piece in the New York Times uh, in the next week or so, which calls on uh, the world scientific community to investigate these intersystemic linkages more effectively. Uh, mm. So that polycrisis project is kind of a larger frame for the Cascade Institute. We're very interested in, in connections between systems. We tend to look, our specialists and our policymakers look at the climate or they look at the economy or they look at the healthcare system or they look at you know, the landscape and biodiversity and they don't see the connections between these problems effectively and Cascade Institute's in the business of identifying and understanding those connections. Okay, try to throw in one more, please. 
the yes. failure of democracy and the rise of the right wing dictators. Right. So that's very much one of the crises that we're considering. And then we have a fourth project that relates to that, which we call the National Dialogue on Canada's Futures. This is organized with Simon Fraser University, in which we hope to engage a million Canadians in a conversation about what kind of Canada we need to have to cope in this crazy, difficult world in com coming decades. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what kind of commitments do we have to have to each other? What kind of identity are we going to have as a nation that will bring us together instead of, uh, instead of driving us apart? There's a, the, the country is at great danger of being fractured uh, because of the economic stresses it's under, because of the potential change in the political regime in the United States, uh, which it could be underway today, for example, with uh, the congressional elections there. So, so the national dialogue on Canada's futures is really about trying to buffer Canada to make Canada more resilient against some of these anti-democratic forces that are un have been unleashed in the world. So well, that's, that's I mean, I, I, you know, I, that's so important. And I have no real explanation. And I, I keep listening to people who have theories about it, uh, about the, 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 what's behind this drift. Um, and oh, I, 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 I think we have, an, it, it, first of all, there are many factors, but a critical one is rising economic insecurity. Uh, and that, especially among populations that have less access or have had less access to education. And because of the shift in the our economies from essentially muscle power and labor power to uh, brain power and ideas as the source of wealth. And, uh, uh, and then I think um, many of those insecurities have been amplified and allowed to explode through social media processes. So, so the technologies of social media have made an enormous difference in terms of uh, allowing <clears throat> Uh, groups to coalesce into kind of echo chambers in which they reinforce their grievances. And, and uh, social media thrives on negative emotions like outrage and anger and fear. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, how, that's how these social media companies get clicks is by uh, providing people with that kind of emotional stimulus regularly. And that just deepens divisions between us and widens gulfs, increases polarization, sort of action-reaction polarization between, between uh, groups that become increasingly unable to, to see each other as part of each other's moral communities. There's a fundamental kind of dehumanization process that's, that's happening in our societies. I think we can- I, I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. I think they're all true, but I think there's something else more. I think there's some secret you know, ingredient that nobody has quite identified. And I, I, I'm, I'm looking for it. <laughs> well, I tell you one that I think is important to sort of loop us around, which is climate change. I think the climate change problem, whether people acknowledge it or not, is an enormous source of emotional distress because it seems to occlude or constrain future opportunities and mm -hmm. possibilities, the opportunity and possibility for progress, uh, human progress and and, and it, it clouds our future so profoundly. Whether you take it that seriously or not, it seems like this problem that we really don't have much control over and, uh, and threatens everything kind of at a global level. And I, I think what we're seeing with especially young people, um, very high levels of climate anxiety around the world in the studies that I've seen, uh, women deciding not to have you know I wish there were more climate anxiety. That's the problem. There are places, you know, I, I don't understand the voters who who support the uh, basically climate denial, just the same as they, you know, but in, in, viruses and, and all kinds of other uh, obvious scientific facts. Right. But climate denial, in many respects, is a, is a manifestation of climate anxiety. People deny because the, recognizing the problems terrifies them so much. I just think that in terms of your point about the, the unrecognized factor, I think that something that is unrecognized, and I've been saying this, for instance, in my last book and in my, some of my recent talks, something that's unrecognized, that's much more powerful, uh, Mm -hmm. Then realized is is the is climate change as a as a 
source of hopelessness and despair that causes people to retreat into their own identity groups for a sense of security and protection. Then what we have to do is let people know that there are solutions. There are things that we can do to actually remove carbon from the air and shade the planet and do things that within five years you can you can see something going. Yeah, Uh, it's it's so distressing to think we have to wait 50 years before there's any hope. Well, I think, you know, as I suggested earlier, you need to you need to. Uh, engaged on all fronts with all the tools available, some of which will have a short timeline. And then you also need to start the process for the longer term transition because we've left it too long. And if we don't start that process now, then when all the short term opportunities and options are exploited, we will be at the end of the road because we won't have planned for the longer term transition. So the two things need to happen simultaneously. We have been, I think, 100% in agreement. You're ahead of me, but I, I absolutely love what you're doing. So, Well, it's been wonderful to have a chat. We've got to keep in touch because everything that you're doing is something I want to follow up on. So thank you so much, Dad. It's been fun. And it's high time we had this little... Yeah, absolutely. I've really enjoyed it. Take care. All the best, Meta. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Project Save the World produces these shows, and this is episode number 520. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website, to save the world.ca. You can share information there about six global issues. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. Project Save the World also produces a quarterly online publication, Peace Magazine. You can subscribe for $20 Canadian per year. Just go to pressreader.com on your browser and in the search bar enter the word peace. You'll see buttons to click to subscribe.